And we're live. Hi, everyone. My name is Mona. I'm a climate campaigner at Friends of the Earth. Welcome to How to Save the Planet Live Talks. Today, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Guy Shropsol and Paul De Silva. Guy is a campaigner on our Trees campaign and has written for numerous publications, including The Guardian and The New Statesman. His first book, Who Owns England?, looks at the past, present and future of land ownership in England. So make sure you check it out. Paul is an expert on the natural environment, biodiversity and ecosystems. He has helped us lead successful Friends of the Earth campaigns, including on the B cause, which persuaded the government to draw an upper national bee and pollinator strategy. We're always keen to ensure equal representation, but sadly this time our third female speaker has dropped out. So this is the second episode of How to Save the Planet Live Talks, following a very successful uh, Q&A with our lawyers in May on our landmark Heathrow win. So thanks to everyone who joined that and gave, uh, gave us positive feedback. We'll post the link of the recording in the chat box, so if you missed it, you can make sure to catch up. So let's quickly go through what to expect from today's live talk. So Guy and Paul will kick us off for 20 minutes with a talk, and then we'll open it up for questions for about another 20 minutes. We've received loads of questions. We've selected um, some pre-submitted ones, but also we'll try and answer some of the questions you can post live in the chat as well. Uh, just do bear with us. Uh, there's been loads of questions, so we'll try and get through as many as possible. The moderators are, mo are monitoring the chat, um, and we'll also post specific actions and chat box, uh, specific actions in the chat box for you as well. Um, you can always rewatch the chat later, so don't worry about making sure you've heard anything correctly, or if you feel like, oh no, I've missed that, it will be on YouTube for you to rewatch you know, to your heart's content. Um, so today we're talking about access to green spaces. And the current pandemic has highlighted just how important it is to have access to green spaces. Um, it's so important for our mental health and our physical health, but it's also revealed just how unequal access to natural and green spaces is. Millions of people are unable to access it, especially in poorer and urban areas. Incidents like the one that happened in New York also show that racial injustice can be a barrier to access in nature as well. So I won't hold you any longer. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Guy to kick us off. Thanks, Muna. Um, yes, so as Muna just said, one of the reasons why we wanted to host a discussion on this topic this evening was that lockdown has really underlined the importance of green space for everyone's mental and physical health, but also how unequal access to green space is in this country, in this society. For some, lockdown has provided a space to really reconnect to nature, a moment to stop and observe the emergence of wildlife again over the spring and over the uh, unusually uh, sunny weather we've had recently. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have access to a garden. I've been just really spellbound over the last few weeks to witness birds and bees, even a grass snake emerging from hibernation. Um, and I've been listening to authors like uh, Lucy Jones, who's been on the airwaves, uh, talking about the mountains of evidence that exists around the physical and mental health benefits of reconnecting to nature. Um, when I've been on Twitter, my timeline's been full of tweets about nature from the commentator Isabel Hartman, who's got a new book out called The Natural Health Service. And she's been encouraging people to post uh, pictures of uh, photos of nature that people have been seeing uh, emerge during spring. Uh, to this week's series of tweets under the hashtag Black in Nature, which has been celebrating the work of black conservationists and biologists. But as with other deep set inequalities in society, there's a clear inequality of access to nature and green spaces. So recently, the Office for National Statistics, no less, revealed that black people in England are nearly four times as likely as white people to have uh, no gardens or other outdoor space at home. And a uh, Guardian analysis similarly found recently that park closures during lockdown hit black and Asian communities and poorer Londoners most of all. So Friends of the Earth really wanted to try and do something during lockdown to highlight the universal need for access to green space and the inequities around access to it. So we ran a short rapid response action to try to get councils to open up more green spaces, starting with golf courses. And golf courses cover over 300,000 acres of Britain, which is actually taking up more space than public parks and gardens. And in London alone, there are over 11,000 acres of golf courses, almost half of which are owned by local councils. 
yet during the height of lockdown, uh, may, most of them were empty because golfing has been banned. And whilst I have nothing particularly against the sport itself, it's ultimately played by a small fraction of the public, whereas parks are you know, used and accessible to everyone. An email action with a few thousand of our supporters in London. Uh, over 500 of them contacted their councils, urging them to open up municipally owned golf courses as temporary parks during lockdown. Um, the aim being obviously to make it safer for people to exercise while socially distancing. So, you know, more green space, easier to, to, to stay distant and keep safe. Um, and we were delighted to really get responses from several councils whose councillors enthusiastically came back to us and said, yes, they were indeed opening up their courses as parks for people to walk in and jog in. Um, others told us they couldn't do so because of the contracts they have with the private golf clubs. Um, and yet we also heard from other private clubs who had been voluntarily opening up to the public. So that was great to hear as well. Um, of course, things have now moved on. We've seen changes to lockdown rules. Golfers are allowed back into courses. But we also really hope that just as lockdown has forced local authorities to rethink street space, so starting to kind of repurpose roads, which are, you know, perhaps got less traffic on, but now being able to be opened up to be widened for wider pavements, for people to walk in more safely uh, and uh, more space for cycle lanes. We really hope that this moment will sort of change in how councils and the government centrally think about how parks and green spaces are essential um, for everyone's health and how we need more of them. I mean, it, we only need to look at what the Minister for Local Government, Robert Jenrick, um, ended up declaring in the middle of lockdown, um, quote, for the health of the nation, people should be able to enjoy safely in green space which is something I think we very much agree with. So I'd now like to hand over to Paul, who's going to talk a bit about some of the other issues around access. Oh, Paul, I think you're on mute. 21st century. Is that happening? Thanks, Guy. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And welcome. Thanks for joining. So what have been quite interesting to notice over the past decade is the growth in the amount of evidence that backs up the access to nature. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, detailed studies in terms of benefits to from early years, children's development right through to people uh, wanting physical health. Uh, there's quite a trend now for GPs to do what we call social prescribing, which is asking people to spend more time exercising in, in nature rather than just expecting medical treatment and popping a pill. So those are those are some rare, very interesting trends in NHS circles and healthcare circles. And we are talking to the NHS as well as government bodies around uh, some of this and how we can get more of that as an exception. So there's some very interesting uh, studies around that. On the access point, just to underline what Guy said very recently last week, um, the charity Fields in Trust, which you may have heard uh, of, came out with its updated Green Space Index for the UK. Uh, Great Britain uh, had some very revealing figures, but the headline figure from it is, um, is that over two and a half million people in Britain don't actually have um, green space within a 10 minute walk of their home. So, um, you know, th there are all sorts of pressures on green space and some towns or some regions have a dearth. Um, and as Guy said, you know, it can also depend on your, your social uh, situation as to whether uh, you'll, you'll um, have that space nearby. But there are also other pressures such as um, whether you have the time, whether you feel safe in green space, all those other things combined. It's not just about whether you have space nearby. Although I think I've certainly noticed a lot of people saying during the lockdown how they've discovered their local area more and realised there was a great space around the back of them, but they never went near it because that's not the way they usually go out. This also ties in with uh, government guidance. There is um, guidance from the government's uh, nature watchdog, Natural England, on how much green space people should be able to access in their neighbourhood. And the accessible green space standards are... Um, in theory, and you, there as, as guidance for developers and councils, but um, I don't think they're very well used. It's going to be interesting to see how they're updated because we know from Natural England they are going to be updated fairly soon. Um, but they say that everyone should be able to live within 10 minutes walk of green space as well, but it's quite clear that that's not the, not the case. Um, so we'll see how that's, those standards are updated fairly soon and whether they actually end up getting any bite as opposed to just remaining vague guidance. 
I think the other factor here to bear in mind is the austerity agenda um, and the effect of funding cuts on local councils. So councils are under pressure, as we well know, and parks and the provision of parks are not actually a statutory service like collecting the refuse. So they are under pressure. And even during, um, I'd say, midway through the last um, decade, the austerity decade, it was already being the British Lottery Fund. The parks are uh, suffering also in all sorts of ways. They did a report in 2014 on the state of UK public parks and reported that parks are at serious risk of rapid decline and even being sold off or lost to the public forever uh, through development or just neglect. Um, so we've also been working with various other organisations to promote what we call the Parks Charter. You can look it up online, the Parks Charter, to improve the funding and management and long term security of parks. So that's just some of the context to the issues of access, but also um, some of the realities of the funding threats we're seeing at the moment. Um, I'm going to hand back to Guy now to talk a bit more about some of the practical um, and campaigning restoration work on nature. Thanks, Paul. Yes. So um, I guess our talk this evening is also, uh, as well as being about reconnecting to nature, it's also about restoring it. Um, so I just wanted to say a bit about um, Friends of the Earth's Trees campaign, which I've been um, involved in um, over the last year, which is meant to restore UK forests. So, yeah, we, we launched the campaign a bit over a year ago. We started with a petition calling on the government to double UK tree cover um, to help address the climate and nature emergencies. Um, that petition has now had over, I think, 150,000 signatures. Um, we're still accepting more, so if you haven't yet signed, please do um, visit our website to sign and, sh and then share it with friends. And um, I think that might be being posted, uh, a link to that in the chat box, but also you can just go to our website, friendsoftheearth.uk forward slash trees, and you'll find it there. Um, but why? Well, um, beyond, beyond the fact that trees are just simply wonderful, beautiful, living things, um, look lovely, support lots of things, squirrels, birds, beetles, mosses and all sorts of things like that. Trees also, of course, have a really big role to play in regulating the Earth's climate uh, by sucking down carbon dioxide out of the air, uh, locking it up in their branches and trunks. And obviously there's already a very dangerous amount of carbon in the atmosphere due to the fossil fuel economy. Um, we're seeing that right even now, even, even in this country where we're seeing um, dangerous swings in uh, in extreme weather from the floods we were having in north of England and Wales uh, back in February to some of the unusually hot and dry weather we've recently experienced. Um, obviously, it's even worse in many countries around the world, particularly in the global south. And so alongside doing everything we can to rapidly uh, and radically um, slash carbon emissions from industry, transport, our homes, we also need to draw down as much CO2 as possible from the atmosphere um, and trees, as well as other natural, natural habitats like peat bogs and ancient grasslands, are a really key way of doing that. Um, but the key, UK current up 13% woodland cover, which is just really low compared to other European countries. Um, in uh, the EU, the EU average is uh, woodland cover is about 38%. Um, and England is even lower; it's just 10% woodland cover nowadays. So you know, people are rightly appalled at things like tropical deforestation in places like the Amazon. But we have to remember that we've deforested the UK as well, and it's just happened over a period of centuries. So we tend to kind of sometimes conveniently forget that. So to start to put this right, we've been calling on the government to set a bold ambition for the recovery of our forests. And up until now, um, the government in Westminster has kind of contained itself with setting pretty weak, non-binding targets for increasing tree cover by just a few percent over an, over a period of many decades. Honest, and in a time when we've got Parliament declaring a climate emergency, we've got another uh, a dual ecological emergency at the same time in terms of the collapse of biodiversity. That really isn't good enough anymore just to um, satisfy ourselves with these sort of half measures that the government have been doing. So that's why we're demanding that the government double UK tree cover. And England, in England, that means going from the current 10% to 20% woodland cover, which is still obviously pretty low by international standards. So there's not enough land on this little island for that many more trees. Well, in fact, we've looked at this, we've done the analysis, we've crunched the numbers, and there is in fact more than enough land for us to double tree cover without impacting on valuable farmland or other precious and protected habitats. And there's also loads of potential for incorporating more trees into productive farmland as well through what's called agroforestry which can mean everything from um, in, enlarging the size of hedges, 
to growing shelter belts for livestock, to restoring orchards, which we've lost far too many of over the past century as well. So in other words, producing food uh, as well as growing more trees. And one of the questions that was submitted in advance of tonight's um, talk was asked how much carbon could be locked up through doubling UK tree cover. Well, our best estimate of that is that doubling UK tree cover could store around 47 million tonnes of CO2 per year, which to put it in context is about 10% of current greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a really significant amount of carbon pollution to be dragging out of the atmosphere and locking up um, safe in, in habitats like trees. So we're now approaching a pretty critical moment to influence the government on trees, the forthcoming consultation on what's called the English tree strategy. So this is a government policy document that will govern how many trees we grow and what sort, what species and so on for many, many years to come. Um, so we're currently gearing up to submit loads and loads of evidence to this consultation. Um, we're going to be launching an action that will make it super easy for anyone to make a submission to the consultation um, in, in the near future. Um, in the meantime, if you're really keen to do so, we'd really encourage you to start thinking about that, um, about making a detailed submission of your own, um, because we really uh, are aware that the quality of the responses that we send to the government is just as important as, as sheer quantity uh, of numbers. So particularly if you're in something like a Friends of the Earth local group or a climate action group and you uh, or a call or whatever and are able to have a discussion about this um, and think about whether you'd like to submit something as a group, decide who can lead on a response, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, we're a bit frustrated to be able to say that there's still no dates yet for the consultation. We have been waiting for this from the government for months, but when it is finally out, we'll be certainly sending around a briefing to all local groups on how to submit your views and making everyone aware that this is now out there. So just quickly to recap, three ways you can help, you can get involved and help with this um, campaign. Um, please sign our trees petition. Uh, the link is in the call to action. Uh, sorry, the link is in the chat box. Sorry. Uh, please make a submission to the English tree strategy consultation. As I say, there will be a forthcoming Friends of the Earth action on this. But um, if you're in a group, uh, please start, start thinking about how you might be able to do so. And if you're not already in one, please join a climate action group. So with that, I'm going to hand over back to Paul again. He's just going to talk a bit more about restoring some of the other habitats that we need to protect. Um, and some of the other crucial debates about policy and legislation that are going on at the moment. Yeah, th thanks, Guy. Yeah. So um, if you've been involved in Friends of the Earth for a while, you may know that we've also done uh, historically quite a lot of work on trying to protect uh, our peatlands uh, for very, very many of the same reasons as Guy's talked about in terms of trees, because peat is fantastic. Uh, very important habitat for nature, but also a fantastic carbon store. And we're we're not doing ourselves any favours by digging it out of the ground and selling it as cheap as chips in a in a garden centre. So um, this year, the government was supposed to hit its targets to phase out the use of peat in, in domestic garden use. And um, as with many voluntary uh, measures, it's managed to fail. It knew it was on course to fail, but uh, it spectacularly failed. So we have high expectation that the government will now bring forward firm measures to, um, and to give people real choice to buy um, alternatives for growing uh, stuff in the gardens and window boxes. So that's an important issue. And we're working with other NGOs on that to pile on the pressure. We Like the England tree strategy that guys talked about, we were also expecting a uh, an England peat strategy is long overdue, actually, and inevitably it's been delayed by lots of things. But we have been very clear with the government that we do expect them to stand firm on, on phasing out peat use and also then looking at proper measures to restore um, eroded um, peatlands. Um, and this applies not just in England, but in uh, Scotland as well, uh, as well as Ireland, as we know. And there's also issues about importing peat from from other parts of Europe, particularly the Baltic states. So that's that's an example of how we're trying to look at particularly important habitats from a kind of biodiversity and a, a nature uh, a kind of. Um, well, we can certainly let you know more about that. There is a blog on our website about the importance of peat and what we've been trying to do. So our work on peat very much complements and mirrors the work on trees. I think the other thing to bear in mind moving on to the policy field and the and legislation field is um, I feel quite strongly that the planning system, the way we decide what gets built and, and where and how, doesn't do ourselves any favours in terms of nature and certainly not in climate terms. 
um, along with um, modern intensive farming, it's probably of nature's decline and the reason why we're locked into high emissions. Uh, and um, I think other parts of the UK are starting to address this by having better land use planning policies and joined up policies across different aims of government. But only for now in England, the government's plan approach to planning is to make it as easy as possible to give permission to development, whether or not that development is of good, de good decent quality and is even needed. It's a debatable point, but I've been involved for a long time trying to stop the planning system in England from being further weakened. And we probably, along with others, have failed on that. Um, so uh, there's 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 a, an issue coming up right now because the government has signalled that in the budget it wanted to see more uh, reform of the planning system, ostensibly to make it easier to get development fast-tracked through. Again, regardless of whether it was good or needed. Um, the evidence is that, you know, development is uh, very often coming at the price of spaces and places and nature that people say they value. So we'll see what the next plan of running, uh, round of planning reforms look like from the government. We may well see uh, announcements on that fairly soon. Um, it will be particularly interesting to see whether the planning reforms or, or further intentions have any kind of fit at all with what we're regarding um, post-Brexit Britain and particularly the Environment Bill and the Agriculture Bills, which are going through Parliament right now. So briefly on the Environment Bill and the Agriculture Bills, major pieces of legislation, along with the Fisheries Bill, we shouldn't forget that too, for marine purposes, uh, delayed by Brexit first, and then the election, and now by the uh, C-19 COVID lockdown. Uh, they are significant pieces of legislation um, the environment sector is very clear on what's needed uh, from from the environment bill and from the farmed uh, the, the agriculture bill because it will set the course for um, post brexit uh, environmental protection and oversight and governance uh, the the agriculture bill is really important because it essentially sets a new path from the old ways of uh, farming where we gave farmers and landowners money to basically produce um, even if it came at the expense of animal welfare or environmental standards or consumer standards even. And so we are looking for government to completely switch the way in which taxpayer funds are given to farmers and landowners every year to make sure there are very strong strings attached to incentivise the proper shift that we need to proper uh, stewardship of water species, habitats, land, soils. That's a fairly fundamental shift and so far we seem um, confident the government will go in that direction but you know we we're already seeing backtracking on imports under trade deals with the US on uh, commitments previously made around food standards and consumer protection so we'll have to see on that so the agriculture bill is really important the has a very strong section on the broad nature and biodiversity content or rather it's got a major section on it whether it's strong or not is 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 down to uh, um, our our um, efforts, I suppose. I think the question for the Environment Bill is, will it see a step change in the action to restore nature? The evidence is very clear that nature is in trouble in the UK. It's not just about the Amazon or wherever. Those are clearly important, but we need to be acting at home as well as abroad. And <clears throat> we do need a landmark piece of legislation, that's what the government calls it, that will buttress that action and, and set it truly in in law. It also needs to really empower councils, local councils and communities to do their bit. Um, and it also needs to uh, come with proper funding and support for um, communities and local authorities and others to play their part, because there has been a massive uh, loss of skills with local authorities to make good decisions on, on things that uh, are important for restoring nature. So I think the other thing I want to say on the Environment Bill, which some of you may have noticed, you may have heard being talked about in local authority or other circles locally, um, but is coming your way, is going to land on the ground uh, because the Environment Bill contains these measures. There's going to be, a, in theory, there's going to be a stronger duty on nature or biodiversity, as biodiversity duty on local councils and other public bodies. Um, there is already a uh, a biodiversity duty 
that dates back to 2006, but it was pretty weak to start with and has really been ignored ever since. So we're going to have to see how that plays out. Will the Environment Bill strengthen that duty and make it absolutely clear that local authorities and other public bodies have to abide by it? Local councils and um, uh, either singly or in, or in cooperation with neighbouring local authorities will be asked to draw up local nature recovery strategies. Um, these sound great. The danger is that they just become glorious lines on maps and and um, when you need to look at a whole landscape and a whole county rather than just, or district or borough, rather than just convenient corridors. Um, so you may well hear about local nature recovery strategies, you may well hear about the biodiversity duty on local authorities. And if done well, these could be really very uh, important and strong ways to start restoring nature, as well as restoring the skills and the resources within local authorities and communities to, to, to play their part. I think the, the main area of the environment bill that we're particularly concerned about and have been trying to um, ameliorate in some way is the the fact that the bill will set in law a sort of a legal system for what's called biodiversity net gain um, and I think this is sophistry in the extreme but we'll have to see how it goes but biodiversity net gain um, or the son of biodiversity offsetting as I sometimes call it is um, being promoted as a way to allow development to take place um, and still have nature thriving rather than just nature um, suffers totally at the hands of housing and other development. Friends of the Earth is still very concerned and suspicious about biodiversity net gain. We're doing a lot of work with others behind the scenes to try and really tighten the rules around how this will work. But if you hear about biodiversity net gain, um, that's what it's about. We, are, we have got a blog on our website about it right now, and there'll be more coming from us about it. But it looks like um, that's, that is something that planning authorities um, at the local level will have to do. So the more you're aware of it coming down the backs at you, the better. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, both of you. I found that really interesting and actually learned some new things as well. Um, uh, I hope you guys did as well. So now we're going to head uh, over to questions. I've got two screens here. I feel like I'm in like a BBC news desk, just getting live updates. All I'm missing is just a producer in my ear telling me to go, go, go. Um, so we'll start with our first question from Helen. And I think this really speaks to the themes we've been trying to get out from both uh, Guy and Paul. So Helen asks, Throughout the pandemic, many people without gardens have often felt like second class citizens. Should urban parks be restricted to those without private green space? So, Paul, I, I'll, I'll go to you for that one. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, my, my initial reaction is that I don't think so, simply because public parks are public assets and therefore they should be free for all. Um, there is, a, as I said earlier, there's danger that parks are lost or they're sold off because councils can't afford to run them. The communities can step in to an extent, and there's some very good examples of that, making better use of parks uh, for food growing or nature and play and things like that. Um, I think fundamentally people need to see better design of housing and open space in their areas uh, and that that space is accessible so they can use it. There's far too many examples of housing in the past and even now which where space either doesn't exist or the space that does exist is boring amenity clipped grass and, and, and hedging of low amenity value and certainly not great for um, nature. And then you get that classic um, no ball games here or keep off the grass type signs. Which, um, very restrictive and, and not a great example of people needing the space outdoors rather than just uh, a roof over their heads. So I also think parks could be a place where communities can come together from different backgrounds and knowledge to share skills and get to know each other. So um, we should be using parks more as um, a community resource I think, and to make it restrictive would probably be too much, but I totally get the essence of the question. Amazing, thank you. So I'm just waiting for the second question to come through. Um, this is all, so this, this is this is all live. 
Okay, so we've got one of our first questions that's come from the chat box uh, for the panel. Um, do you do uh, do the panel believe it's a good idea to have citizen assemblies to create change on these matters? And that can go. I'm happy, Guy. Would you like to answer? Happy for it to go yeah, to sure. Paul. Yeah, I mean, it might be something you know also about Mina. I guess with with the work you've been doing, but I mean, it feels like that actually. Um, to be able to solve climate change, you need more democracy, not less. And that actually having climate assemblies are a really good way, uh, like the one that's being run or has been run in the UK Parliament recently, uh, to try and crowdsource ideas about from everyone about how we decarbonise. Obviously, uh, some as we need to do to be able to decarbonise our economy um, is to do with behaviour change in the sense of like, for example, adopting lower carbon diets, uh, eating less and better meat and dairy. Um, and so it's really important that we're kind of really uh, understanding where public opinion that is at in terms of being able to shape that and and take forward um, some of these more uh, radical measures um, and I think you know uh, we've seen probably too much in the way of centralized thinking by government um, in this country for a very long time and actually being able to not just have consultations but properly have um, proper debates discussions informed discussions which the whole principle of that sort of deliberative democracy that I think we need to see more of I don't know if any of you have other things you wanted to add to that. I was just going to say that I think I was just going to say that I think there's some really good examples of local authorities really engaging with their communities because they can't do it all. And a local neighbourhood level, um, citizens forums and things like uh, informed things, um, bring in wider views, uh, communities can step up. So whether they're citizens assemblies in the way that you know, we've seen with the climate stuff, which are, I think is fantastic um, at a neighbourhood level or a slightly uh, broader level. Um, I think it's good. Um, it doesn't mean everyone agrees, but that's the point. That's the richness of, of that debate. So uh, I'm all for it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So this question comes from Julian. Uh, how can the campaign for more green spaces for all the best uh, be allied to the pressing need to use land for reforesting to help with tackling carbon emissions? Guy, I think this is for you to answer. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so, I mean, I think the key here is um, both making existing green spaces, the public green space is greener, um, uh, and then trying to in incur increase access to um, spaces like woodlands and greenbelt and so on, um, so to make them more accessible. So, I mean, within cities, that could mean um, more street trees, it could mean more trees in parks, it could mean more funding for parks so they don't close, as, as Paul was uh, sort of talking about earlier. Um, I, I wonder whether, you know, if we're sort of thinking about like more about um, the land around cities, peri urban land, uh, many of our biggest cities have, have green belts. Um, they're principally a uh, a, a planning designation, they're a very important planning designation for constraining development and making sure there isn't urban sprawl, but perhaps um, uh, this is something that maybe in the 21st century we need to be thinking about how we perhaps update some of the kind of the, the role of green belts. Um, so this is something that Paul, Paul and I have sort of talked about quite a lot in the past, is, is thinking about greening green belts, and so that could involve both more trees in the green belts, more nature reserves, um, perhaps fewer golf courses, harking back to what I was talking about earlier, but, 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 but both allying the, the fact that, that green belts are very close to where lots of people live, but actually a lot of people don't necessarily realise that they are there as you know lovely bits of countryside. Um, so we need to do things about increasing access or better signposting the fact that green belts exist and are there for people to enjoy, um, as well as improving the nature that. Uh, Fab, Paul, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. No, I agree. <laughs> Best answer. <laughs> um, so we've got, I think this is more of a, a comment, but uh, so we need to encourage allotments to open up uh, more to local communities and, in, uh, and engage with communities with activities beside, besides actual gardening. Um, this is a question for you, Paul. Do you have any reflections on that? Yeah, well, it's a it's a really interesting point. Um, I've I've talked to National Allotment Society and others, and I know they're trying to um, look at how uh, allotments can be 
more multifunctional spaces. There's some, there's some really good evidence actually that allotments are brilliant for, for nature and wildlife. Well, on the on the Bee Course campaign we did, there was one of the studies showed that allotments are one of the peak um, or the best uh, habitats for uh, certain species of, of, of bee and, and other pollinating insects, actually. A variety of stuff there all year round, as well as places to, to hide, um, to hide, to uh, shelter. Hide, maybe, you know, sometimes. Um, Freudian sleep there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, hide from predators or whatever, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, so I think um, there is a bit of a shift going on within the allotment movement, but obviously each allotment society has its own rules. So, you know, and it's hyper local. So, um, uh, but, you know, increasing numbers of them are using them to do orchards or even have. Um, uh, bee colonies on them, manage bee colonies and things like that. So um, it's been a bit of a turnaround because I remember a few decades ago where where allotments being lost quite a lot, actually, and people were running campaigns to save them. But the argument was no one wanted them. But now I think there are lots of queues for allotments. So, um, you know, we need more food growing spaces all over the place, not just in big monoculture fields in rural areas. Great, thank you. So this question comes from Marge. Um, will there be a, a requirement for biodiversity net gain to be achieved near to the areas where biodiversity is being lost to development? Yeah, it, well, very good question. Again, there is all very good questions, aren't they? Um, very pertinent because uh, under when Owen Patterson, the former Environment Secretary, tried to lever biodiversity offsetting into the uh, into the um, the rule book for co for nature conservation a few years ago, we we actually caught him napping and and stopped him. Actually, he was he was trying to claim that biodiversity offsetting, i.e., you would lose a piece of land to development, but don't worry, it would be created somewhere else. We found that actually the rules he was creating meant that that extra land wouldn't be local at all. It could be up to 100 miles away. So you're not going to jump in your car to go 100 miles unless you're a certain uh, high senior ranking civil servant, maybe. Um, so the um, it's a moot point. And we have been in discussions with DEFRA and Natural England really trying to tie down the, the definition of local provision so that stuff just isn't, isn't exported. It's a very complicated area. Um, and the danger of biodiversity net gain is that everything is driven by the housing market because you may have areas where there isn't a great deal of land uh, needed because that's not where the houses are going to go and therefore you might have regional imbalance created. But yeah, this is something you need to look out for because there is a danger of people will try and say, don't worry, we will create it and it will be much further away than it needs to be and the excuses will be found for it to be justified. So he needs eyes in your back of the head, but we're here to help on that. That is good to know. Thank you, Paul. So we've got this question from Steve um, and they ask, uh, how do we change current farming practices to be more sustainable um, and kind of more eco-friendly? Eco Excuse me, uh, Paul, that's for you to answer. OK. Um... Well, I referred to earlier the fact that the um, can it be seen as a plus sign to leave in the EU? Yes, it can. The common agricultural policy was pretty disastrous and they kept promising it would be reformed and it never really was, not 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 anywhere near what was needed. The UK has made uh, a big claim about making our own rules and therefore has made some very strong statements about trying to get, um, as I said earlier, farm payments to be to come with very strong strings attached such that uh, you really do have to prove that you are a steward of the countryside and, and nature and habitat, so as opposed to just claiming that you are. Um, and there are some very good farmers and landowners out there doing really great work, but they're not the majority. So that needs to change and that can be incentivized through the public money. So that's route one, I suppose. Um, you know, at the back of all of this is the is the fear that US trade rule deals and things like that will undercut everything. It's like the, you know, it's like the uh, um, the the problem everyone's been predicting and the government has been saying, you know, we're, we're scaremongering. So the, the, the wrong deal with 
with any US administration, let alone this one, could just cut on the land from under everything that we hold, hold dear. And at the moment, uh, we don't always agree with the National Farmers Union, but actually we're, we're in lockstep with them on a lot of this. So um, if we really want to improve conditions for nature, um, starting with genuine agricultural reform has got to be uh, one of the top things we do. So, yeah, um, so keep an eye out for the agricultural bill. It's just about to go into the House of Lords. But you should be on your MP about this right now, particularly any sign of government weakening uh, to uh, dodgy trade deals with um, the US or any other administration, I would say, for balance, because I'm politically impartial. That is a great last addition. Thank you so much, Paul. So I think this is uh, the the last question, and I think it's actually a really great question to end on, um, especially since the rise of um, the school strikers and youth activism. So Tina asks, how can we do our bit in saving our planet, even if we are even if we are below the age of eighteen? Guy, do you want to tackle this question? Yeah, I'll give it a crack. Um... It was a while since I was 18, unfortunately. Um, but I just think it's been so inspiring, as you, as you mentioned, Mina. Just, I mean, it, it's it's really not an exaggeration to say that a lot of the last, <clears throat> excuse me, most recent wave of climate activism has been spearheaded by people who are below the voting age, you know, to, who have risen up and taken such a, an amazing. Um, uh, set, you know, amazing set of actions to uh, to really force climate change back onto the agenda, um, and you know obviously it's, obviously everyone's heard of Greta Thunberg, but it's 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 obviously thousands and thousands of people who are less well known uh, than her who have been organising and mobilising, getting people out onto the streets, um, uh, and you know going on strike and so on, and and also I mean this is also reflected um, perhaps less well known, but it is reflected in um, the nature conservation world as well. And um, I really encourage people, if you not if you don't know them, if you're not on Twitter, but want to join and follow them, there's some fantastic, really young conservationists out there. People like Dara McAnulty, I think I pronounced his surname there correctly, hopefully, but he's got a, a new a book out called A Diary for, of a Young Naturalist, he's just published it. He's just 16. Um, he's already written a book. It's amazing. Um, there's people who are campaigning for nature conservation and as well as for increasing the diversity of the conservation sector, like Maya Rose Craig, she's just 18. She tweets, I think, as Bird Girl on Twitter. Um, there's Bella Lack, who at the age of 70 has a Twitter following of about 150,000 followers, which is uh, way more than ever I can uh, aspire to getting. Um, and I mean, you know, all of these different ways in which um, young people have been showing that they are, you know, just leading the way in, in these regard. I just, it's really amazing. So um, I don't know if either of you have anything else you wanted to add on that. No, I think I'll just echo what you, what you said. Um, it, it's so inspiring and also really challenges the notion that um, change comes from the top. Obviously that's something we wouldn't agree with as Friends of the Earth, but also that change comes from like adults. I think their, their inspiration and their energy and sheer passion um, has totally rejuvenated the climate movement um, and it's one that's made me even more prouder to, to be a part of. Yeah. Paul, I don't know if you want to add your thoughts to that. Well, yeah, what I see going on is a lot of um, intergenerational stuff, actually. You know, it, the planet isn't going to be saved because old people do it or just kids do it or whoever. Uh, what I see particularly because of the lens of, of nature and concern about species or habitats or ecosystems is that people are learning from each other and it's almost irrelevant what the age you are but well, you know such as the people guys mentioned are going to be around longer than me and him and others so they've got a bigger stake in it you know arguably I'm not going anywhere just yet but you know it's like yeah they've got they've got their whole lives ahead of them so they should be concerned and you know, I think increasingly they also get the join up between climate change and nature. You know, it's not an issue over here and an issue over the air, over there. The evidence is all the scientific evidence shows the interlocking of the two and also the consequences for humans and deeper poverty or uh, difficulties for food production if we don't get that right. So absolutely get the, you know, I think people get it. And we're doing our best to try and articulate that and, and point people, um, give people the good information to act on. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Guy and Paul. That brings us to the end. Um, as you know, community groups and community campaigning are at the heart of what we do. Yes, people power. Um, and if you want to get involved in a group near you, then please head to takeclimateaction.uk. As Guy said, you can also sign our petition calling on the government to double UK tree cover at friendsoftheearth.uk slash also submit a response to the English tree strategy consultation. That is a mouthful. Uh, that's going to be published soon. And we'll also be sending out guidance to help local groups and our climate action groups um, submit once that is live. If you have any questions or if you feel like your question wasn't answered fully, then you can contact our supporter care team um, at info um, info at fo.uk or you can go to our website and find the contact us button so thanks again to our speakers and thanks again to our audience for listening we hope to see you at the next live talk in the meantime you can re-watch this talk and the previous one on Heathrow you can also check out how to save the planets podcast um, and there'll be a link posted to that now and there'll be loads of episodes that you can listen back to on that so that is it from us from me, from Guy, from Paul. Um, take care and hope to see you soon. Bye.